and um, so like I said um, and by the way, pause. Um, Johan Fritz has actually mentioned that they have they embed the uh, the barcode right into the genetics, so it's not like you can just get like a you're going to need some kind of special technology that's not available to the public to, to figure out who these clones are that were <clears throat> attached to these barcodes. But go ahead. Well, that's what I was saying. Uh, when your when your uh, group got infiltrated. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that because, like I said, they can be weeded out. And uh, these shapeshifters, you know, uh, they haven't got that barcode on them. They can be weeded out. And um, But I'm all for one thing is, is resetting everything back to the way it was. And... Um, I know there's a lot of people that love the United States, but, you know, hey, you know, uh, having worked at Camp Hero, uh, and having witnessed it firsthand that their history has been tinkered with, along with their religion as well, um, you know, it's just a big head game is all it is. All right. Uh, so I guess the next question, uh, planetary corporations, you said they're going to go bankrupt. I mean, if they've been financing, I mean, supporting this, the secret space program off world, what, oh, couldn't they just migrate off world? Isn't there, there's more economy. There's, um, billions of people off world right now because of all the time travel. They've gone back in time to set up colonies. Um, right now planet earth is almost insignificant to them. What? They, what well, what, you know, I, I'm glad you you pointed me in that direction because we, you know, uh, we can get on with the Captain Dallas and the Nostromo story now. Um, let me let me kind of tell you how all that leads into this. Um, back when I was uh, in between uh, Camp Hero and and uh, Nellis Air Force Base. Um, I, I was, uh, I went and, and talked to uh, one of our guests out there at uh, Area 51. And, um, you know, I was in between jobs. Um, and, you know, having come back from Vietnam, I, I couldn't, I couldn't hold a job. I, I, I just, it was just a real hard time for me. And um, so when I was talking to our guest out there, I said, well, you know, I cannot fight as fast as you can because uh, their uh, reactions, uh, their nervous systems about four times faster than ours are. And I said, well, I'd like to, I want something quiet. Um, I want to make a little money and I want to be able to help, you know. And um, I said, wouldn't it be good if I could get a job, you know, hauling cargo? And, uh, and you know, like if somebody broke down their spacecraft, became disabled, um, you know, I could render some aid to them. Um, because I have uh, gone to uh, crash sites with, you know, aliens, uh, you know, in need and, and rendered assistance uh, as a child. You know, I grew up like that, uh, trained in uh, rescue and recovery. So my teacher said, well, um, you know, they was going to fix me up with a company called Whalen, you can't, Whalen uh, Corporation. And I said, that sounds good, you know. And um, so I went off and uh, went to school, flight school. And uh, I, it, I was learning how to fly through a simulator 
what is what would be now the Nostromo spacecraft. Uh, I'm sure y'all have seen the movie Aliens or Alien One. And uh, but at the time, you know, uh, I just want to fly cargo and make a little money, you know. And I was so tired of all the wars on Earth. I was tired of fighting my fellow man. I just wanted to be, you know, to re recover, recuperate. So after I, you know, did pretty well on the, on the flight simulators, uh, I was sent out, so sent back to Camp Hero, and I was teleported <clears throat> to a planet called uh, Thetis. And Thetis is on, is in the southern constellation. Uh, it's down towards um, Zeta Reticuli, up in that part of the, uh, the sky or space there. And I, when I got it on Thetis, um, I saw the other uh, Montauk boys. And of course, by then, they're no longer boys. They're, they're grown up. You know, they're, they're young men. They had come from uh, Vietnam, Cambodia. And uh, they were uh, toughened up from the war. And, uh, <clears throat> and I seen one of your old friends there, James. Uh, believe it or not, Preston Nichols was running the teleporter machine on, um, on Thetis. And, um, you know, I talked with Preston. He said he'd been there for, um, for about a year or at least about a year. And he really liked it, you know. Um, it really shocked me because I always, you know, um, pictured, you know, Preston uh, around Camp Hero or uh, Brookhaven National Laboratories, you know. But um, but he was there running a teleporter machine. And um, <clears throat> so while I was at uh, Thetis, um, you know, I saw the Nostromo spaceship that I was going to, you know, pilot. And um, I found out that I was going to be hauling uh, ore, 20 million tons of ore. And, um, but Preston, uh, the, the, the craft wasn't ready just yet. Um, and um, they were, you know, loading it up and making some final adjustments to it, you know, and, um, but anyway, when I was, um, you know, on, on planet there, um, I was very curious about um, the star map. Um, when you get out towards Zeta Reticuli, on the back side of Zeta Reticuli, when you're leaving out, you have the outer, uh, the outer veil, the outer core. And it wasn't mapped. It was just a, a blank up in that part of the, uh, of space. And I asked uh, the intelligence officer there, I said, why don't we have any maps of this area? <clears throat> and he said, well, you know, 20 years earlier, uh, Whaling Corporation had uh, sent a satellite in there to map it and it was lost and that's why uh, we have no uh, you know n no charts in, uh, in that part of uh, the space so I you know kind of forgot about it you know I you know I was more concerned with you know the craft and the Nostromo but Preston <clears throat> went on to the Nostromo and he was uh, putting in some new electronics. And, um, and it took, you know, um, a week or more to put, the, put it all in. And they had to attach a, a new antenna onto the Nostromo. And um, I asked Press, and I said, what's, what's with all the new electronics? And Press said, uh, well, um, 
you know, like SETI, like you have SETI in Socorro, New Mexico, you know, the radio telescopes, you know, and they listen for, um, a along with um, uh, the telescope in South America, uh, the one that's in the, in the um the dip of the mountain there. They listen for uh, communications in deep space uh, where there might be extraterrestrials. And um, they say, well, uh, we're putting a SETI type of computers onto the Nostromo and we're adding a new long range antenna. So, yeah, at the time, I, I didn't think much of it, James. And, um, but anyway, you know, uh, after I got everything loaded up, the other crew members started to come. And uh, I don't, I'm not going to say their real names because, um, you know, they have a right to privacy, just like I do. So we had a, a crew. I, we know we had Kane, Ash, Parker, Britt, Lambert, and Ripley was going to join me on this uh, craft. And, uh, you know, we were going to head back to Earth towing the uh, 20 million tons of uh, ore. So anyway, we departed uh, Thaddeus and, um, on our way. And uh, once we got all the the systems checked, uh, you know, we we're going to go ahead and go into hypersleep. Now, the return trip from Thaddeus, Theta, excuse me, to Earth is 16 months if you're in hypersleep. All right. Um, and Mother is um, the computer on the craft. Um, mother is basically, um, is MU-TH-UR-6000 mainframe 182 model. It has a 2.1 terabytes of art artificial intelligence. So it's a pretty smart computer. And that's the main computer. There's another backup computer. On, on, a, on a deck below that, B deck, uh, that's a two terabytes. So um, anyway, once we ran all the systems check, you know, uh, the ship flies itself. So we went ahead and turned on in to the hyper hypersleep systems. And um, next thing I know, you know, um, the systems, uh, you know, woke us up. And I was thinking, you know, heck, you know, we're near an earth, you know. And Lambert went down and, you know, Lambert's one of the uh, navigators. In fact, she's one of the best navigators I've ever seen. And Lambert came back and told me, uh, she said, Captain, um, uh, we're not we're not near Earth. And I said, what's going on? And um, she said, well, we're not, we're, we're nowhere near it. So at that point, you know, I went down um, off the, um, you know, the main, uh, uh, you know, where we, you know, the main chamber um, and went into, I uh, got the key and opened up the room and went on in and sat down to mother and, um, you know, typed in, you know, the interface, uh, and you know, to try to find out what was going on. And um, so anyway, when I, you know, interfaced with it, uh, I had a, um, a message come up, a special order 937. Well, you know, I knew it. Nine three seven is kind of, you know, it's 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 something's up. You know, it's like you're getting a you're in a nuclear silo and you get you know a certain code. You know, there's certain codes that it doesn't sound good. 
but when I opened up the computer, it said priority one, ensure return of organism, all other considerations, secondary, crew expandable. So I'm thinking to myself, what is going on here? You know, um, so I didn't tell anybody, you know, because that's privileged information. Uh, no one below me has that access except the science officer. Ash is the only other one. And I had not worked with Ash, uh, you know, but one time before. And everyone else, you know, was new to me, um, you know, because they had never been on the Nostromo either. So, <clears throat> you know, I'm heading into, because Mother is automatic, I was going into the outer, uh, to the core, to the outer core. And um, I ended up, approaching a planet called LV426. Now at that time it was it was, it was given a number. There's no name to it at that point. It's just LV426. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, you know, hey, um this has got to be that satellite that was mapping twenty or so years earlier that got lost and um you know this with this new antenna and uh on the nostromo we're able to pick it up you know so um so i'm i'm thinking at that point you know this is just you know i'm gonna go out gonna land the nostromo and just go out there and pull the memory on the uh on the uh, the satellite and get back into the craft and you know get back uh, up in the sky and go about my way home you know so um, when I came in to land uh, the craft um, you know try to give you an idea here I, I want to first give you an idea before we get into the landing part I want to give you a, an idea of the, the, the size of the Nostromo and the characteristics of how you fly the Nostromo so you have an idea of what I was faced with. Now, when the Nostromo is hooked up to the refinery that I was pulling, Mother controls everything. Okay, Mother controls everything. But when I extend the Nostromo out and detach it from the biblical cord, um, it's under human flight control. That is the purpose of the captain. Is my the only thing I do is fly the Nostromo uh, from point A to point B. So it's under at that point no computer. Uh, can handle the Nostromo and each planet you know there's millions of planets in the, in, our, in the solar system and each planet has their own signature their own gravitational pull so there's no computer that will um, uh, land the Nostromo it has to be done by uh, by, by human Okay, so, you know, I've got, if you, if you look into the film of the Nostromo, you will see, uh, I brought some wind chimes on board the Nostromo as an audio alarm. I put them on B deck and C deck, and then on A deck, I had a little, um, I had a little um a little bird. It was basically a tube of water, tube of fluid, and it had a little beak on it and it pivots back and forth. And what I'm doing, um you know, I have that 
it it's kind of looks like decoration, but um, it gives me an idea of how much tilt is going on. Even though I have a gyroscope on the on my computer, uh, I also have uh, some backups uh, in there uh, as novelty items. But my landing gear uh, is as long as a six. My landing gear, if I extended my landing gear down, it's, it's as tall as a six-story building. Okay, so you're, just the landing gear is six stories in length once it's extended. And the size of an Astromo is like 1.1 1 .1 million cubic cubic feet okay 1.1 million cubic feet so if you put the Nostromo if you had to compare it uh, it's as long as a super tanker uh, in 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 the in an ocean uh, if you try to take the Nostromo uh, the largest building in the United States is the NASA uh, flight assembly in uh, Florida and Nostromo would be as tall as a space shuttle okay so it's it's pretty huge as far as the uh, how large it is but uh, when I was coming in to land the Nostromo onto LV-426 I had a real strong gravitational pull like I'd never seen before. So it was telling me there was a lot of iron in that planet. And um and I could the 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 chimes on the B and C deck um you know were rattling and cause of the vibration in in the ship motors. So that was uh one reason I had the, the wind chimes there. And on the um, my little uh, bird uh, was just dipping back and forth, and of course I had my gyroscope on my computer. But um, on my way down, my video feed on my port side went out, so I couldn't see my landing gear, uh, what was going on uh, as I was coming down onto the surface. Of LV426, I was basically landing without seeing what was underneath me, and uh, so the engines of the Nostromo was, you know, really straining very hard to land this craft, and I was bringing it down very slowly, and um, when I was bringing it down, James. Um, part of my landing on my, uh, that's a little bird there. It, it helps me, uh, see how much pull the, that I'm getting, uh, uh, going on in the ship there. Um, but anyway, um, when I was trying to bring it down, part of my landing gear got on a rock and um, then all of a sudden the rock split and I had a real hard jar in the craft and um, I had a lot of uh, pressure relief valves that went off. Um, if you took um, a thermal reactor, uh, well let's, let's, well let me, let me back up here. If you took a, a, a pressure cooker and you put it on the stove and you brought it up to boiling um, and you tilted the pressure cooker and instead of steam coming out underneath the weight, you would have um, you would have hot water spilling out. Um, but it's kind of like this: I have a thermal reactor. Uh, back towards the engines and uh, so you don't want to you don't want to tilt a thermal reactor um, 
vibrations to a thermal nuclear reactor is not good. Uh, if you take a look back at Fukushima, Fukushima back when they had the earthquake in uh, Japan, uh, it caused a lot of damage. Uh, um, valves uh, laying off steam, you know, what have you. So a lot of those valves had sensors on it, and uh, you know, I had a lot of sensors that got burnt out on the uh, the Nostromo, and when we landed, so um, we had some some slight damage internally to the Nostromo, and I, you know, I radioed to Parker, and you know, Parker you know, radio back. He told me so many hours, but it was enough time where uh, I could go ahead and, you know, depart the craft and go out to go get this, pull the memory on this satellite, mapping satellite that I believed that had gone down. So, um, Britt and Parker, um, was going to stay behind with Ripley, and uh, Parker and, and Britt was going to uh, take some parts out of one of the the scout craft. We had two scout craft on the Nostromo, uh, but we took parts out of one of the scout craft and um, used it to make the repairs to some of the sensors that were damaged. Um, by the uh, the sudden jar uh, to our reactor, but uh, while I was gone, um, with um, I took uh, Lambert and I took Kane with me, and it's about I don't know maybe about a two mile hike, um, two two and a half mile three mile hike. From the Nostromo to the um, to the satellite, and it was you know slightly before sunrise. Once we started off walking to the um, to the uh, supposedly the the satellite, and um, on the way there, you know, um, we finally got within range of the, what I you know, where the target was going to be at. And by that time, the sun was coming up, and and it wasn't a satellite. It was a, it was a derelict spacecraft. And, um, well, it was a spacecraft. And I just presume, you know, there were some people trapped on it. Um, so we went ahead and went up towards the back of the, the the spacecraft I found a hatch back there, and we got it open and got up on up into this um this craft it was it was huge and um you know the only light we had was from our um uh, from our headlamps and um you know a few handheld lights and we got into is rather large this craft and um I saw uh we Kane climbed up on one of the platforms, climbed a wall, and he was the first one to see the uh the um the engineer. I call him an engineer. Uh but it's basically uh an an astronaut. And I got on up there with, and I went and got, I went ahead and got up, pulled Lambert up behind me. We all three got up there, and he was up on a, he was in a flight chair, James, and um, I got up onto it. He he was dead. He had been there a pretty long time, and. Um, you know, he, he had a, I thought he had a gunshot wound at first. Um, so I thought I was, had walked, had, I thought 
they had to get the the, the astronaut had been murdered. That was my first thought. So I, you know, I get, went around and came up on the other side of them. Usually, if you shoot somebody, you have a, a entry wound, and then you have an exit wound. Well, I knew that he had, you know, two or three ribs that were broken. So, you know, I went on the other side and tried to find the, the entry wound. Couldn't find the entry wound. And um, so I got suspicious, you know. I, I didn't understand it, uh, you know. His the way his ribs was pointed outward, and uh, so while I'm examining him, Kane uh, had found a, a a a hole down below the platform of the chair, and he hollered for me to come take a look, and. Uh, so I got on down, I seen the hoe, and uh, we had uh, the tripod with us. Uh, we was going to use a tripod to try to, you know, winch the door off the, the satellite when we found it. Of course, there's no satellite, so we went ahead and used the tripod to lower uh, Kang on down in it. And he got down there, me and Lambert was up above him running the uh, the winch and everything. And he got down there and um, I lost communication with him. Then I went down and uh, found him and got him back up on to the walkway and he had um, something attached to his helmet. And we went ahead and you know, got got back out of the craft, and we carried him. Um, we took the um, the tripod and um, um, you know made a, a stretcher out of it, and uh, brought him on out of um, you know by rolling back the Nostromo with the uh, the organism attached to his face. And when I tried to get in the Stromo, you know, the, they Ripley wouldn't let me in. And there was some, you know, um, words exchanged. I'm not going to say what I said back to her, but, um, you know, I made it very clear for her to open the door. And she disobeyed the order. So, um, you know, I was eventually let back in by the, science officer and got Kane in and we brought him on down to sick bug and um, I went in there with Ash and to examine it you know get his helmet off I had never seen anything like it um, and um, you know I just I wanted it off of him so I ordered Ash to go on and to remove it, you know, to remove the uh, parasite from him. And, you know, we prepped him for surgery. You know, we x-rayed him and, you know, prepped him for surgery. And Ash, you know, took a little laser and cut him. And uh, some fluid popped out of his leg and it hit the floor and ate right through the floor. Well, I'd never seen anything like it, you know. Um, you know, it, was, it had acid for blood. Um, and, um, of course, you know, we went down into the, uh, we stopped the, uh, um, the operation at that point. And uh, we went on down and it ate through. A deck and uh, B deck and stopped stopped on B deck. It was trying to go down to C deck, but it stopped um, pretty much on B deck. And um, you know, I wrote it in the report, you know. But um, but anyway, we you know 
Um, when air, you know, we put them in sick bay, and and was, you know, by that time, you know, we're prepping the ship to try to get it back up and off of LV426. You know, I just wanted to get out of there. You know, we didn't have uh, any uh, video leads on um, B and C deck. You know, I just wanted to get gone. So, you know, we took off and got back um, up in space and uh, hooked back up to the refinery. And um wasn't long after that, you know, that Cain came out of his coma and, you know, the creature, you know, fell off and, um, you know, brought him down to the galley, you know, was going to feed him. We, you know, we're just glad, you know, we just get out of that place, you know, get back home. But it, that's when the nightmare started. I mean, it got all in there, you know, and was eating. Next thing I know, he's having um, some type of epileptic fit. Parker put a, you know, a spoon um, in his mouth, and he wasn't having epileptic fit. He wasn't having a heart attack. I'm going to pause you right now. Um, can you comment about the advanced, um, how advanced the medical technology was of the med beds at that particular time? The med beds uh, were much more advanced than what we have now. Uh, so, so why didn't it detect the parasite or able to extract it? Well, it had not fell off of its face at that time. And the egg, uh, see, the, the once it attaches itself to you, it can take anywhere from 16 to 20 hours before the egg matures, okay? Now, from the time that it attacked him, it probably took us, you know, I'm to carry him from, um, from that spacecraft back to Nostromo by hand. You know, we lost... Uh, I mean, it was getting dark. It was dark when we got, you know, we started out 20 minutes before dark, and we walked. We spent a good part of that day just trying to get back to the Stromo, carrying him. So, you know, we had lost uh, probably a good eight, nine hours just trying to get him back out of the hull, back to the Stromo. Okay. So, we're looking at about eight, nine hours from the time that uh, just to get them back onto the Nostromo. And then by the time that we, you know, got off of the planet and got redocked back to the refinery, uh, it was around about, about 15, 16 hours before the, the parasite fell off his face. Now, the egg had not it may not have traveled down the orifice into his chest. Now, he did have a dark spot on his lung. Uh, it looked like blood when I first saw it. Um, so, you know, the, I guess that was the sales that we were looking at. Um, you know, I had a good 3D picture of him. And, um, but the egg had not started, it may not, from the, from the first time that we ran the scan, the egg may not have came down the canal into his chest. All that it had in his chest at that point was the, uh, it was a real dark reddish color, like a, 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 a dark, a real dark maroon kind of an orange looking color in his in his lung there was no egg there at that point but once that the fluid got down into him uh because his lung was warm the it, it was a perfect environment for whatever this parasite to grow 
okay? Uh, this parasite grows real thick. I mean, grows real fast. It just had not gotten, it had not built any mass when I first ran the scan, okay? When the scan was first ran. Um, but uh, you have to remember, we didn't have an operating bed on the stroma like you had on the Prometheus. I've been on the Prometheus when Mr. Whalen was on there. Uh, we didn't have that that type of med bed on the Stromo. If that answers your question, there. Continue on. I'm well, just showing more footage. Well, getting back to when we were at the table when we were eating. Uh, when Kang started convulsing, you know, uh, it, you know, I knew it wasn't a heart attack. I thought he was having some type of seizure, simpler, very similar to epilepsy. And then his chest started, uh, you could hear this thing just tearing his chest up. And it, it broke through his chest. Uh, uh, it just, it's unbelievable the strength that that little, that creature had. And it did the same thing to his chest as what happened to the engineer on the derelict spacecraft. It just burst through it. And, and it, and it shot blood on me. You know, Lambert is screaming. I mean, her nerves, I mean, she's a good uh, navigator. Uh, I have to compliment her on that. If it wasn't for her, I, you know, she's she's very she's very good at what she does. But she just had she was having a nervous breakdown. Uh, she was terrified of it. So was Ripley. All of them was terrified of it. And I'm just you know I'm dazed by. I've never seen anything like it. And Ash was, you know, just like me. Um, he was perplexed by it, and once it popped out of his chest, um, you know, it just, it was there for a moment. The next moment, it ran, you know, it ran across the table, and out the door it went, you know, the hatch. And Nostromo, you know, 1.1 cubic million meters, I mean, that is very huge, okay? And like B deck and C deck is not as well lit as A deck. A deck is where you have your central heat and your cooling. Uh, it's, you know, very uh, clean. Um, you know, you get on B deck and C deck, those are, those are working decks. You know, their light is, you don't need that much light. Uh, it is lit. But, you know, you don't have the, uh, the coolness. Uh, this creature needs heat. So once it got on off of A deck into B and C decks, I believe the heat accelerated the growth. Okay. It seems to need a, a warm environment. Okay. Ooh. Is its native habitat uh, volcanic planets? James, I don't know where it comes from. All I knew was was that the eggs, when I went down into the craft, the derelict craft, it was almost like it was tropical down there. It was, it was like, um, you know, it was almost like it was like about 120 degrees. It was very, very warm and very, very moist. So the eggs, it, the eggs had to be kept warm and moist. Okay. Now, when it got, when it got off of A deck, you know, B and C deck is warm. Now, in the Nostromo, we have water tanks. Um, if you watch the movie 
you'll see kind of like a little bit of water coming out of the engines. Uh, the water causes the, uh, the, the, the heat to expand. It gives it more power. Um, but we have just real vast amounts of water. So there's a lot of steam down there, you know, uh, on these decks. And, um, but once it, once it got down there, you know, um, I went back and went back to mother and, you know, was trying to find out what was going on, you know, and, um, you know, was, I, I couldn't, at the time, I couldn't call out, um, I had, I, you know, I, I had so much going on, so I went ahead and went into the, I didn't want, I didn't want management to know what was going on, because at that time, I didn't know enough to tell manager what had happened, I'm still accessing the, what is, what's going on around me. So I went into the computers. I wanted to find out more about what was going on about Special Order 937. And I went in and I gave, a, you know, the emergency, the emergency command override, a Special Order 100375, where I could go dig, you know, deeper into the computers. and. Uh, you know, I tr try to ask it different questions. Uh, how could I, you know, isolate or kill it? And it would just, uh, it would, it would run me around in circles. It wouldn't, it wouldn't give me a clear answer. You know, it did not know. You know, there's at that point, there's no. I can't even pull from the computers because nothing like this had ever been seen before, okay? N nothing like that ever been, had ever been, been uh, ran across. So what I did, you know, I got out of the mother and I went back and I called the crew together. And they, you know, they were still shook up. And I, you know, I told them, I said, look, uh, we got to search the ship. So I broke the broke them into two teams and um the the first idea i had was to you know we thought it was using the air ducts to move because um it wasn't on a deck we searched a deck real well and we noticed where one of our uh covers had been ajarred so we knew it was in the the air shaft um, cause I, you know, one of our covers had been knocked loose. So what I did, I was going to get in the air duct and try to get it out towards the airlock and flush it on out, you know, blow it on out in space. So we didn't have any weapons on the craft. Um, so we rigged up some crude flamethrowers and, um, you know, we had a uh, ash got a uh, uh, wasn't really that good. It was a um, a little device. If you rubbed your waved your hand in front of it, it uh, you know it would show a, a movement of 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 density of molecules. It really wasn't that good um, to try to track it. But anyway, I got into the air system and was trying to find it and it got in there and they saw some movement coming um lambert did claim she lambert claimed she picked it up and i ended up running into it and fired my uh flamethrower at it and it took off and about the time that it did that you know um I lost, I'd used up all the fuel in my, um, you know, my, my flamethrower and my headset, you know, got knocked off of my head and I had busted 
my my headset so i couldn't call back to lambert you know and i'm in the dark you know i can't see anything um and i'm just you know i'm in a massive um uh, air you know a massive ventilation system and i'm so i went wandering around in there i was in there for a couple of hours just trying to find my way out and uh, eventually found my way out but by the time that i found my way out you know um i come out of the air duct and ripley had panicked and she had uh grabbed jones now i want to stop uh the movie is not a documentary okay um and i'm going to get to tell the story about how the movie was made uh, but i'm going to back up about jones here jones does have fur and his fur is a light brown but jones is not a cat jones is a gremlin and jones assists me on the on the on the ship he is one of the crew members it's a gremlin not a cat so ripley my biggest mistake uh i had slept with ripley before um uh, years before and when she came on when she first came on the ship uh i knew i had trouble and uh so i said well you know hey ripley you know we always have females on board cuts down on homosexuality you know what i mean so as a commander that's one of the perks of commander you get to pick who you sleep with so told ripley to get her trash come on up to my cabin you know you're sleeping with me i'm the commander but she got in there in my cabin and she seen jones she had a fascination with jones and um she apparently grabbed jones when she panicked you know and she's got this thing about jones great scott i hope she don't sleep with them you know um like but i think she thinks he's a pet or something but she grabs jones and she takes off with my gremlin my crew member and um she tries to blow the, the craft up she's she's terrified okay so first of all ripley does lie the real Ripley in, in real life has multiple personality disorder. She's a presidential model. She lies left and right. And she deserted her ship and she deserted her crew. And if there's anything, she's very frightened of the xenomorph. So she sets the, the craft to self-destruct and the other um, crew members are cocooned at this point okay they're not dead they're cocooned you're you're not looking at a documentary you're looking at a movie okay so when i got down to the computer uh the you know the the self-destruct computer is not a countdown there are four levers for each one of the thermal reactors she had pulled two of the thermal uh taken two of the uh screw uh heads the the we arm the uh those are the the detonators and she had screwed them into the tubes and pulled the tubes up and pull two of the four handles so i had two reactors that were going to blow up two the, the other two actors were not 
set to self-destruct, just two, two of the four. So I went in there and uh, I deactivated the self-destruct system. I knew the command override. She did not. She didn't know how to override it. Once she set the Nostromo to blow up, she took off in fright. Okay, so uh, the Nostromo did not blow up. So, you know, once I got the, the reset that the, the uh, was able to set down the self-destruct, you know, I was in the Nostromo all by myself. Now, you have to remember, I don't need a crew to fly the Nostromo. Once the Nostromo is docked up to the refinery and Mother is working, Mother can fly the craft. I don't need a crew. All right. So at that point, you know, uh, everything is back to normal. I have some crew members that or have been cocooned and I took those crew members and I put them in to the hypersleep systems okay that's the best thing to do is to freeze them and I got in there after I put them in I got into the um, you know uh, I radioed through the computer you know I told every Thing, what had happened? Um, I put everything into the log of the computer. I made about ten notations uh, into the computer during the time I was on there, and uh, the ten days I mean. And um, so, anyhow, Mother returned to Earth. I believe it was somewhere around Antarctica. We have an air traffic control station in Antarctica. And when Mother went into, was basically stationary over Antarctica, um, the, the company boarded the, the craft and they took me, Lambert, and uh, uh, Parker. Uh, you know, Kane, well, Kane's dead at that point, but I'm talking his body, okay? Uh, they took us all off of the Nostromo, and they brought me to an underground facility. There was beds set up, IVs in there, you know, um, and, um, you know, I was scanned. Uh, there was no parasite in me. But because I had, had alien contact, you know, they didn't know what type of disease these things have. You know, um, if they're carrying any kind of viruses or, you know, bacteria, anything. So uh, they kept me isolated from Lambert. Um, eventually Lambert got transferred back to uh, Nellis Air Force Base and she drew some pictures of the creatures. She had a complete nervous breakdown um, and I'm not going to say her, her real name but she talks about uh, the creatures that she drew in a, uh, a notebook uh, when she was uh, being treated uh, for her mental breakdown, um, and but um, but with me it was a little different. They wouldn't let me leave um, the base, and I eventually, uh, you know, things got a little little hairy for me. Uh, I found some grenades and. Um, I put them next to a hatch and blew the hatch and escaped um, Nellis Air Force Base and um, 
got up onto the highway and got out of there. Um, had I not done that, I don't know what they would have done with me. Um, but um, I wasn't infected. And that's been like 40 years, you know what I mean? So I'm, an, I'm no danger, you know. But I did get... Um, so, so this event roughly took place somewhere in the late seventies, early eighties. Oh uh, yeah, it took. It would have been before the movie, obviously. So, I think it, what did? Go ahead. I, it was around seventy nine when it, uh, late seventy nine is when it happened. And you have to remember, you know, when you can time travel, it doesn't matter when it really happened and when the movie came out. But what happened was Ripley knew. In real life, Ripley knew James Cameron's first wife, not his second wife, his first wife. And uh, what happened, Ripley took the, uh, it's my understanding that Senator Robert Byrd of West Virginia uh, Senator Robert Byrd <clears throat> uh, knew what happened. He got a hold of the top secret uh, uh, transcripts of my communication uh, to the Whalen Utani Corporation. And um, I'm not real sure. By that time, you have to remember uh, um, that Lambert, you know, was also talking. I don't know what Lambert said. Uh, I forgive Lambert. She had a nervous breakdown. But uh, Ripley's the one that um, uh, went to um, Senator Byrd's office, and they just marked the names out and put in false names of who this happened to and of course it's Captain Dallas that was one of the aliases I was using at the time and they took that those transcripts and uh, they brought them to James Cameron's wife and she gave Ripley an envelope with forty thousand dollars in cash in it Ripley takes the $40,000, she brings it back and hands it to Senator uh, Robert Byrd of West Virginia. Now that was just the first installment. And so you have to remember, uh, the mission is over. Yeah, that's the guy, Robert Byrd. Uh, he was on the Ways and Means Committee. I used to report to him when I was... Uh, at Nellis Air Force Base. I report to him along with, well, that's when I worked along with uh, uh, Kathy O'Brien. Um, he used to abuse her horribly. Yeah, he, uh, um, it wasn't for me. He, he would have killed Kathy. Um, almost, uh, I like Kathy. She's a very dear friend of mine. Um, um, but, um, but anyhow, I don't want to get off on that too deep. But anyhow, um, when they get a hold of the um, the transcripts of what happened, you know, they can get artists and they can draw up these uh, what the spacecraft looks like, and um, uh, they can draw what the, the creatures look like. And you have to remember these movie stars, they're all sitting around and, you know, everyone's out of work. And when they created Alien 1, I think it cost $10 million to film, to, um, to film the movie, pay the actors, you know, set the props up, all that. But just in the first few weeks at the at the box office, 
they generated over $100 million off of that $10 million. That's not counting about the toys uh, and the T-shirts and the, and, the, and the mugs that they uh, uh, came afterwards. And these, um, you know, you can still go uh, to uh, like Amazon.com and, and buy the DVD. So they're still making money off of, uh, yeah, um, they're still making money off of it. But no, Ripley's a deserter. Um, was there a, was there an android in that film? Yeah. Was a, a, now I'm glad you brought that up about Ash. There's a cat. <laughs> They're saying the joke. Yeah, well, it's, that's that's the. It's not a cat. It's a it's a gremlin. Uh, they also made films off of gremlins because of that. Uh, set off movies uh, off of uh, Jonesy. Uh, but getting back to Ash, uh, when I worked with him. I noticed that when I ran certain tests on the Stromo, his eyes would twitch a little bit. And when I had worked earlier with John Teeter, now John Teeter had said earlier to you during this interview, you know, he was from Florida with the 177th. And, um, you know, he... Um, he knows a lot about c Cyberdyne, you know. Uh, I had always heard, you know, there there was synthetics, but Ash was really the first one that I met. But when I would run uh, certain radio uh, frequencies, will uh, interfere with him. Uh, like, um, if you ever took a radar detector, James, and you drove down the road with it. And you got next to like a mall where or a grocery store that had an automatic door opener. Uh, the frequencies from that um, from that door opener uh, interferes with your radar detector. But frequencies like that can interfere with ash. Um, but I knew something wasn't right about ash. But see, Ripley knew how to work on ash, so. She knew, I think she uh, brought him on along with her. Uh, now, interestingly, when Ash did malfunction, he wrote up a, uh, uh, a magazine. But what had happened before Ripley uh, got on the craft, uh, I think it was Larry Flint. Uh, it, and I'm not real sure about it. It could have been the Hustler uh, magazine. Um, Ripley had done some posures for, uh, you know, uh, naked, you know, spreading herself, uh, trying to make some money. And she would take her, uh, her pinups and put it all over the craft, you know, and, uh, you know, showing off her cleavage, you know. And uh, but Ash took her her her, uh, her uh, magazine, wrote it up, and was sticking it down her uh, her mouth, uh, which I thought was kind of a poetic justice. You know, um, she couldn't throw her you know her snatch on him. You know, because uh, he's a synthetic. But um, but since then I have gone on to kill. Well, not kill, terminate. I had uh, I killed one in a warehouse a couple years after that in a in a press. So we do have um, that was you know after one of our presidential models. Um, uh, I have killed um, <clears throat> or terminated two or three of these synthetics, James. Hmm. Yeah. And did it did it look all like just like uh, in the movie? Was it all a bunch of white, milky stuff coming out of it? Yeah, it's the white milky stuff is a lubricant of some sort. Um, now I want to say this: um, when you look at the movie Terminator, that, that right there. Yeah, it's very. That is a very accurate picture of what it really looks like. <clears throat> um, 
those little tubes, those are fiber optics, mm. and they light up just like a Christmas tree in him. Um, you can't see it, but it'll light up. But the the one the thing about it, um, when you watch the movie Terminator, I think it's either two or three. I can't remember. Uh, so it shows them pouring like liquid, like like liquid lead or something like merc uh, mercury. That's not true. They can't do that. Linda Hamilton, I know her uh, in real life. Uh, Linda got a hold of the intelligence report. Of course, at that time, um, the names are changed. Linda dropped some LSD. So that part about uh, in the Terminator movies where the t the Terminator can turn into a liquid and pour that's that's fa false information, but there are Terminators. There really are, but they're mechanical. But I don't want to get off on that. I just want to try to tell you what Ash was like. But I had no idea. Ash was a synthetic, uh, but when I was running some of the uh, tests on the Nostromo, I could see his eyes twitching. That's one of the tattletale signs of it. Are you there, James? Oh, I thought I had that. Sorry. Um, yeah, so does anybody have any any questions from the audience members um, about this particular topic, rather? Okay, uh, so somebody say who Ash is. Ash was the synthetic um, organism that was embedded into the crew. I guess uh, you said Ripley um, put that. Um, so Ripley was, was working with high-level people within Whalen Corporation. Um, and at the at the, the end result is they brought the the extraterrestrial xenomorph back to um, I guess they do they actually bring it down to planet Earth and to Antarctica to study it. Yes, it's it's been brought back. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I left out a little a little bit there on that uh, alien the xenomorph. Uh, if you watch the movie. Uh, you see it moving real slow at one point, extremely slow. Uh, I was down in the, the, uh, the operating room. Uh, I had told the other crew members uh, to uh, go get some... Uh, uh, to, to go ahead and, and start prepping the ship, you know, um, we, like I said, uh, we were going to go ahead and start locking down. And um, I went into the, uh, into the uh, med lab and I got some drugs in there like you would, uh, you know, like you're going to operate on somebody, you're going to put them under. And I took a pole off of the examination bed, and I got some uh, bandage, some bandages tape, and I took some hypodermic needles, and put them on the end of the pole, like you would uh, a spear, uh, where I could jab this uh, creature if I get up close to it. And um, when I was in there, I just got through taping the the hypodermic needles filled up with drugs uh, onto the pole when I saw it at the hatch and it came on in uh, to the uh, med room. Now interestingly it didn't stand up. I think it recognized me from the from the air duct so it got down on its uh, on his on his tail and scooted across the room uh i think it did that because it didn't want it wanted to try to get up close to me it didn't want to seem aggressive 
But at that point, I knew it was aggressive because it had already attacked uh, Britt down in the uh, engine room. And the, the amount, how fast it grew within a few hours, I mean, this thing was just, I mean, it was growing at a rapid rate. It was over seven foot tall at that point. It, and, but where would it consume food in order to make it grow like that? I think when it attacked Brit, uh, it absorbed nutrients from his body. Uh, at this point, you have to remember, uh, it had not been studied. We're still accessing, things are happening so fast that we can't assemble what's going on. It was killing, it was attacking the crew, killing the crew so quick, okay? Um, and it, it, but, but see it, when it came into the, uh, to the med room, I got between it, there was the, the, the bed, the examination table, and I went around the examination table and I poked it, uh, before before it could stand up and because had it stood up I knew it was going to jump over the table so I wanted to get it before it could stand up and I poked it with the syringe on the pole and pumped in you know a good a good bit of narcotics and then I you know at that point I done got two big valves of drugs in it and it was on still on the floor you know it was trying to get up and I grabbed some more hypodermics and start, you know, taping up on the pole. I hit, I hit it maybe about four or five times, James, with different. Uh, each time I hit it, I was pumping up more and more and more with the drugs. And the more that I pumped it up, the slower it got. So if you, you watch the, the film, you do see it moving real slow because it's, it's drugged out. And at that time, I'm able to uh, to get a net over it and and to get it locked locked down. Okay, I had to get it isolated. Um, but I want to get back and I want to say something here um, about Ripley. Um, when you do look at Alien Two and Three, um. It shows her fighting this alien. Uh, that's not true. Um, Ripley is a spy. Okay, I've been knowing she's been a spy for a long time, and um, so I keep my eye on her. But um, she's very frightened of this creature. And she does not fight this creature in any of the future films. Um, you have to remember, they're not documentaries. They're movies. There, have, there is some truth to those movies. Um, you know, I like on uh, Alien 2, um, you know, at that point I'm using the name Corporal. Hicks, um, that's pretty accurate uh, movie up to the end part. So she, even though those reports are still being filed of, you know, what's going on, uh, she's still able to get access to those reports through Senator Byrd's office, and she's able to manipulate it and have the movies made. Now, when I realized that the movies had started coming out, they all just started coming out at one time. It, it was it was too late. It, uh, she had taken several, about three dozen different files down there uh, with me and sold all those files uh, to uh, movie producers and, and uh, they, she was making 
uh, money off of this. Um, and like I said, uh, if if you had ten million, could make a hundred million. Uh, would you not? I mean, would you not take the script, put in your hand, and and make a movie? I mean, if you could do it, I mean, yes, ninety million dollars profit. You know, so that's what happened there. Did you ever get any money? No, uh, I didn't know anything about the movies till. Uh, she had gotten, when I saw the first movie, I couldn't find out where she went to. She disappears, and then she'll pop up somewhere else. And then by the time that I could try to find her, she she disappears again, you see. But everybody in her, in her real life, people that know her, have, she turns on everybody. And she lies constantly, and uh, so when these uh, super soldiers look up and they and they see a movie, and they start freaking out, and they say, "Well, how I'm having these flashbacks, and you know, how do they know all that?" Well, yeah, because they're um, taking the intelligence files and they're selling them, and um, um. That's what's going on here. All right. Well, we can go down some other movies another time, but let's let's. I got a few questions here about the Alien series. Yes. Um, how similar was the Xenomorph to the one in the movie? The one that you saw. Exactly. Uh, how big did they actually grow to when they're full grown in, at maturity? Perhaps maybe a queen. The queen could grow pretty large. Uh, you know, when I was on, um, when when I went back to uh, LV426, four, four, um, and I, I want to say something else here. Uh, there's a big difference between Space Force and Colonial Marines. Now, Space Force is something created by President Trump, this past administration that you just have. Okay, Space Force is something totally different. Now, when you see Colonial Marines, the, the Colonial Marines or the Montauk boys all growed up. Uh, I am or was with the Colonial Marine Reserve. That was part of my contract. Um, and the Colonial Marines are not, it's not the United States, it's the United Americas. There's no more borders, okay? Uh, we know the United States is illegal. There's no more states here. There's no more North Carolina. There's no borders. There's just the United Americas, okay, James? Uh, but when you see, uh, when you see Colonial Marines, they're usually dressed in gear very similar to what you see Vietnam veterans, uh, combat veterans um, um, were using. And um, so, and this year, what year is this period? Well, the when I took the time jump on the uh, to go to uh, LE four two six, that's exactly about one hundred years into the future. That's when I first made contact with this this creature, but the creature's back at this timeline right now. And so does that mean um, they took uh, the people at Montauk? They they took their DNA, made a copy of them, and they're in the, they're also living in the future now too, like a clone copy. James, um, you know you're you know it's it's a real touchy subject you're saying there. Um, all colonial Marines do not. If you watch the movies, you see them having dog tags. They don't have dog tags. They know some things about us. 
but they don't really know who we are. Colonial Marines do not have dog tags. Uh, that's just Ripley speculating we have dog tags. We have barcodes. On My barcode is on my right forearm. And it doesn't, if you looked at my right forearm, you wouldn't see it. But if I went to Nellis Air Force Base or Creech Air Force Base, whatever you want to call it now, and stuck my arm underneath a special light, it would glow uh, my barcode. So when your group was infiltrated by this, uh, what you call, Okie guy, um, he didn't do any damage. Uh, he got around a few of y'all, but um, he would have been spotted very easy. He never would have made it on a craft. Uh, and I had a company man seen him. Uh, there's a place called uh, Flooring. It's 161. It's um, it's called Fury 161. It's on a planet called Flooring. Flooring is a planet all from Thetis there. And it's a prison colony. Nothing works there. If you watch one of the Alien movies, uh, and I keep getting them mixed up, um, cause I don't, I don't really care to watch them. I already know there's so much, uh, they're all messed up. But, um, if he had found out too much, you'd never would have heard from him again. They would, he'd have been fresh meat. They're always looking for a new homosexual, uh, to bang a uh, furry one, six, one. Uh, so he never would have made it, um, onto the craft, but had he found anything out sensitive, uh, they would have sent him off planet. He'd have been in a prison planet. All right. Okay. So let's, let's not focus so much on hypotheticals. Um, can we, uh, actually here's a comment from the audience member, the fur, and maybe you can elaborate on this. The furry gremlin Jones, uh, it's called a Mogwe. Jones was a cat in the alien movie and a nickname for cats is Moggies or Moggies. Is that you've heard of that? The only thing that I know is that uh, Jones is, is I've I've heard it before, but I can't I can't uh, clarify on it. I've heard that before, but I can't clarify that answer. I just know Jones is a gremlin, and like I said, uh, they put the they try to make as much money off of what they know of us. And so they put the cat in. They knew they was going to make money off the alien uh, film. Uh, and they saw an opportunity to make a film about gremlins, uh, a secondary film. So so uh, was it a cute, cute and furry one or a scary gremlin? Uh I don't know what you call. I wouldn't call Jones cute. I mean, he's a, he's a gremlin. I, now Ripley might think he's cute. She probably sleeps with the thing, you know. Uh, Jonesy, Jonesy's a gremlin, man. He's got his own hammock. Just cause he bunks in my room, he keeps in his hammock. I I keep, you know, in my hammock. He don't. I mean, in my bed. I say in my rack. He keeps his Hamlet, okay? And I didn't want the crew to see him. If the crew's talking or disgruntled, you know, Jones would come back and, and tell me. I can look Jones. Jones is telepathic. And to communicate with Jonesy, you look him in the eye, and he looks you back in the eye, and you communicate. It's telepathic communication. So if someone's slack, and they're not doing their job, you know, uh, Jonesy's going to come back and tell me. Now, Ripley, uh, she fell in love with Jonesy, you know, but Jonesy's is not a pet. He's He serves a purpose there, you know. Uh, all right. Where does Waylon fit into the other space corps? Are they part of the ICC, or are they, are they perhaps a, from another alternate reality that have come here? Or? No, the... Whaling is very is very real. I I know Mr. Whaling. Uh, when I was on um, LV 
223. Uh, I was there when he died. Um, he is of a British origin. Uh, he has a lot to do with Special Air Service. Um, I know that Special Air Service over in England, um, there's two guys in the, uh, in that, you know, two Special Air Service off, uh, soldiers over there that has, uh, that, that's, um, has mining interest in uh, Whalen Yuktani Corporation. Um, you know, he might have picked them up as long with the Montauk boys. Um, you know, gives them jobs. You know, people in the Special Air Service, they don't spend their life there. They get out. They need a job. Mr. Whalen hires them on. And I knew Susan Whaling. Um, I know her. Um, and I knew Elizabeth Shaw in the uh, Prometheus. And, um, you know, um, uh, that show's pretty accurate, except for the ending. Uh, Elizabeth Shaw did not. Uh, take the axe and attack the engineer it was me you know elizabeth is is a pilot and i have no doubt um and the actor that played her was spectacular she, elizabeth is just like that in real life and if and if elizabeth can find them she will okay uh next question how similar was the face hogger to the one in the movie in terms of appearance? Exactly. And was it exactly just just as fast? Like that thing came at you, you even you, faster. Yeah. It's it's cool. it's inc incredibly fast. The it's it's you know that's one thing. I in a way, I I don't want to watch it because it. You know, hey, get. Uh, I, I'm not. It makes me relive it. Okay, uh, I, I can function in society. I'm just saying that when you go through that, you carry the experience with you for life. Well, well, Jimmy, did you ask them to uh, wipe your memories before they return you back to civilian uh, service or duty? No, no. I'm one of those individuals that if you tried it. It don't. It just don't work. Uh, I've always, I've been tased several times, and it always comes back uh, even stronger. I have that. Um, even when I was in Hanoi being tortured, uh, when my intelligence officer was captured, I was only 11 years old um, when I was captured, and uh, you know I was taken by train up through Cambodia. Um, I got real ill, almost died in a uh, in a internment camp out in the jungle. Um, that's when I met President Ho, and um, and you know President Ho never tortured me. It was the uh, the Chinese that did it, but even the Chinese uh, couldn't break me. You know. Thank you. Well, let's go back to this um, this one here. Actually, I. Uh, I forgot I could press his button here, but was Lambert blonde and was she a civilian after being discharged? And that's from Jacob. In real life, uh, Lambert has blonde hair, but she dyes it red. And she's had, uh, Lambert can channel, uh, I used to channel with her spirits, with her and she is um uh she has uh incredible esp abilities we have we're able if i put her in one room and i got another room and we did a you know took cards uh she could guess the cards in another room uh so she has telepathic um um abilities 
She's an enhanced human being. And yes, yeah, she does have the barcode in well, real life. Looks like she died in the movie. So are you saying... No, she, she didn't die. You have to remember uh, it's a movie, not a documentary. Now, I have no doubt that Ripley would have killed her had she had the opportunity. But I was able to override the computer. Now, had that computer had that craft blew up and, you know, it would have been devastating to the Whalen Utani Corporation. I was not going to let that happen because, one, uh, I knew we had came up against a superior uh, creature. And, uh, and like I said, the Colonial Marines... Uh, we fight off-world. We're not going to fight our fellow man. Uh, we're going to fight off-world, and uh, and yeah, you know we're a, we're a, we're we're a mess. We're we're misfits, okay? So we're not super soldiers. We're rejects. We are, um, you know, uh, we're just Montauk. I grew up. Okay. Uh, going to Sean here. So many, so many people are just about this gremlin. The uh, Jones. What, uh, could you describe maybe just the facial features? Well, how, Jones, yeah, how tall is it? Jones is about 11 inches tall. He could be about 12. You have to remember he's got fur. You know what I mean? Uh, the fur of the cat is exactly like the fur on Jones. Jonesy. Um, I call him Jones. I think his name is Jonesy. I just call him Jones. And Jones uh, is about, like I said, about a foot tall. He's slender. He has two arms, two legs. And um, he's highly intelligent. He's, uh, you know, he is, he is really something. Uh, he's not like the gremlins you, you see on TV or in the movies. Uh, they make them look like the cute little furry things, you know. Uh, but Jonesy, you know, if you knew a, what a gremlin was, if you've been around them, um, you know, they're just, they're in, there's something. You just have to experience it. Let's go back to, uh, so was Lambert discharged as a civilian? Yes. So that, she's theoretically still alive today, possibly? Yep. She's alive and she is well. I have not talked to her. She has since remarried. She has gotten on with her life. I would love to sit down and talk to her. And, uh, and if I ever had to do it again, um, and I hate to say it, uh, I would take her over Ripley anytime. And she is a wonderful person. And she is a very, if it wasn't for her, Earth would be in a very, very dire situation. And the Does colonial... escaped? I'm sorry, what would you say? They have escaped, the xenomorphs, escaped into the general population? No, they have not escaped. Uh, we're studying them. Uh, and we know how to fight them. Now, the Space Force does not. What Trump has created has, uh, uh, has never came across them yet. And hopefully, they'll never come across them. All right. Did, uh, did you ever go back to the derelict ship where, the, I guess, the eggs or the face not not to that particular derelict ship. Now, if you watch the movie Prometheus, when we land on LV-426, uh, there was a host of ships, like a landing, underground uh, landing uh, uh, pad there. There were several ships there. And the synthetic uh, was damaged uh, during the fight with this... Uh, with the engineer, 
uh, Elizabeth Shaw, uh, and I have to say it to her, um, I think she's a wonderful person, and I miss her dearly. All right. Um, well, let's see if there's any more questions. Um, some of my comments here. Jacob, again, uh, Rick Gingles, and <laughs> for sure, Jimmy says, CCP monkey steamroll everyone. Actually, I wanted to show a picture here, a draw, rather not a picture, it's a, it's a drawing. Let's see if I can pull this one up. Uh, let's see. Give me a moment here. I, I sent this to you, but I don't think you got it yet, so I'll just share it on the screen and uh, just do, okay, do this. <laughs> Uh, here we go, Mecha Kong. So um, I can't read Cyrillic, but <laughs> that's, that's it. I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> what they look like? <laughs> I've never, I've uh, never seen anything like that. Okay. Uh, well, well, we can go more into that. I, I like to learn more about that in prop button next show, but um, we'll, we'll keep with Dave. Um, all right. Let me just check here if there's any more good questions, and then we might. I think we'll just call it a night. Um, this was a very fascinating. Uh, journey here uh, into this other aspect of reality that uh, we're told is fictitious, but evidently it's based on a true story. Um, oh, here's a good one. Would you ever go back and uh, do space mess uh, missions again, um, if you could, and why, why uh, did you stop? Well, first, if I did go back, I would want to have a little more freedom. I want my children are being held at Area 51. Um, and I would like to have permission to search for my children as long as it did not interfere with me doing my regular duties. Uh, I, I, I like surveying uh, different worlds. Uh, collecting rocks. Um, I, love, uh, I love being a pilot, but I'm not here to serve the United States government. Um, I am a colonial Marine, and, um, and, I, and I care a lot about Earth. And yes, I would go back, but I would not bring Ripley. She, no, uh, that I didn't have no control over her. Uh, I did not ask for her. And, uh, and I have no intentions of making any public appearances or making any movies because uh, um, I think it's wrong uh, to exploit uh, the colonial Marines. Do you think your children uh, might have been put into the colonial Marines? Or eventually, uh, I believe my daughter. Uh, I, I had a little gray one time. Uh, told me my my daughter was in uh, communications. I have a son. Uh, he looks almost. He could probably almost fit in with you. Uh, his fingers are a little longer. He's telepathic. And he has telekinesis. I, I've got a little bit of telekinesis, but he has a lot more than me. And he would uh, he would roll a ball across the room with his mind. I could roll it back. And the Navy out at uh, out at Nellis Air Force Base has hid him from me. His name is Daniel, and he has blonde hair. I've never seen him. All right. Um, <laughs> more, another question about Jonesy. What do you think? Uh, does Jonesy have a family? I don't know. I, I never got personal with a Rick Gremlin. <laughs> I mean, he's. I just see him as a crew member, like, uh, you know, um, Jonesy, if, if I had to, to try to, uh, he's biological. I mean, you know, he's bound to have a mother and a father. Um, 
I'm told that they come from um, around where Tibet is in, in um, China, is what I'm told. Maybe from another alternate reality or dimension. Um, yes, yeah, so why, why bring those aliens there? Is it, was it for the telepathic abilities? I'm sorry, could you back up and be a little what, more clear? Why did they bring Jonesy there? Was it for telepathic abilities? No. Um, I believe Jonesy has been on that craft before uh, our crew uh, ever arrived. He's he's probably been out. That one of the strange things about the Nostromo, um, some of the writing in the computers and on the uh, particularly on the self destruct uh, panel that Ripley tried to use is both in English and in other languages. Uh, it's multilingual. Uh, uh, other words, it could be, you could be French, you could be um, uh, Hindu, uh, you could be Spanish. Uh, so I got the impression that the Nostromo is built uh, for many different types of crews. You know, you may have a, an English crew or a, um, a French crew or a Hindu crew. Um, and Jonesy, some of the symbols on the, the, the keypads were very like, um, kind of like uh, e Egyptian here, uh, Egyptian uh, writing like what was on the Roswell crash. So that's telling me that uh, probably extraterrestrials back engineered this using uh, technology from uh, that we have and, and, and built it. It's a shared vessel. Mm -hmm. I never saw these other crews, but um, okay. I, well, can you comment about this question here? Uh, are we, is it relating to the movie Gremlins? <laughs> the same type of Gremlins? Uh, I think it does. Uh, now, how... I don't know anything about... I don't know if anything's true about that movie. Uh, I know I never fed Jones after midnight because uh, it could kill him. Uh, about the water deal, no, I don't know anything about that. Hmm. But um, um, wow, I don't know about something cute and cuddly or a monster. I mean, he's just he's a gremlin. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Elizabeth says, uh, "Ask uh, will Space Force get debriefed regarding the Xeno?" What do you think? I don't think they will. Um, you have to remember that United Americas doesn't come, uh, the United States is not going to last much longer. And Space Force will, uh, they have back engineered craft at Area 51. Uh, but uh, they, they have a short history ahead of them. Um, the Colonial Marines, um, you know, we're spread across different planets. Um, and like I could go, I could go tomorrow and get in a cryogenic chamber, you know, hypersleep chamber. And I could be in there, say, a thousand years and pop back out, you know, so, um, I believe some of us are, you know, preserved for future generations to fight uh, xenomorphs. Yes, I believe we are. Uh, here's a quick question. Did the deer like ship look like the one in the movie? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, it looks like I had one more question. It is much, it is much larger huh. than the Nostromo. And the Nostromo 
is pretty doggone large. You said it was, Nostromo is like the size of a super tanker, an oil super tanker. And yeah, it, it's the size of the space shuttle. The you know when space shuttles hooked up to the massive rocket tanks, you know mm -hmm. the two massive rocket tanks that the space shuttle sits on. Uh, yeah. It's the, the NASA Space Center in, in Florida. That building, that hangar that where they house the uh, NASA rockets, it's the, the largest building in the United States. And I can just barely get the Nostromo in there. So this derelict spacecraft is, is I mean, Nostromo is one-tenth the size of, of the derelict spacecraft. Wow. All right, uh, so <laughs> we're coming back to this. Uh, just real quick, what do you say? Everybody falls. There's, there's not going to be a China. There's not going to be a United States. There's, there's not going to be a Russia. It all falls. And right there, uh, do, you, do you know what percentage of it will survive? Very few. Very low numbers. Uh, when um, the Georgia Guidestones was built, I was there uh, when with um, the man, the men that built it, and um, so there's the population is going to go below 500 million. It's going to go down to about about a hundred and. 35, maybe about 140 million. It says down to 500,000 perpetual harmony, perpetual, you know, a balance. Um, it's 500, gonna, worldwide. 500,000, excuse me. It's going to get down to about 100, uh, around, around about a quarter of that before it stabilizes. All right. Uh, can you confirm, yes or no, Predators in the movie Predator? Yes, I've uh, killed two of them. I killed one in uh, Cambodia. Uh, that movie, and uh, some of those guys are still alive. Um, I have them in my computer, but I have not reached out to them. Uh, what they did in the, about the one that was killed in Cambodia, that movie was rewrote where, some, uh, where it was killed in South America, but it was technically killed in um, Cambodia, and I killed it. Um, and um, you know, it uh, go ahead, yeah, let's save that for next time. I'll yeah, put that let's more. save it. All right, because we're, yeah, we're, we're running really um, a little bit longer than normal here. A quick comment from Ricky a space shuttle is 200 feet long, and the oil tanker is about five times longer than the space shuttle, so um. I think uh, the Nostromo will probably be a bit bigger than the space shuttle, probably, if well, it's is true. I'm talking about there's 3.3 cubic mil million feet in the NASA space building. So I'm talking cubic feet, not height or width here. Ah, okay. The, the Nostromo is 1.1 cubic million feet. All right, well, let's go ahead and leave it at that. Uh, do you have any other final comments you want to make? No, I'm just, uh, I have no intentions to go public as far as meeting with uh, any of the super soldiers. I don't consider myself a super soldier. Um, you know, I'm just a, you know, a pilot who uh, came from Area 51 and worked at, uh, Camp Hero, and um, and um, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, someone was asking about Arizona Wilder. When uh, we also had some information about um, um, the guy that, that talks about reptilians in the UK. What, what's his name? Ed Ike. I, I know David Ike. Yeah, we can go. I've been knowing David Ike since he was 17 years old. Yeah. We'll save that for next time, though. Sorry, everybody. But, uh, yeah, this, this show's uh, gone on long enough. So thank you all very much. Thank you all for listening. Be sure to subscribe to this new channel now, evidently. 
And um, also visit my website, supersoldertalk.com. I have uh, the links to the videos um, and also some other posts as uh, not just Super Soldier Talk. I, I find other posts on there related to this topic as well.